Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about managing global virtual teams or international teams in general. I chose to deliver this training module in the format of a video lecture because one, there will be some visual materials that I would like to share with you and it's better and easier to show them on the screen. There will be some short video clips and there will be some illustrations. So this format will work better. Second, I just wanted to show you what a video lecture might look like. Uh, so for your program, you will have to prepare at least one pre-recorded video lecture. And I will teach you how to do it from the technical point of view later. For now, just as an example of what it might look like. Now, international teams is a very, very big topic. I teach two different courses on managing international teams here at the UNCG and I probably cover 5% of what I actually know on this topic in those courses. So you can literally write books and dissertations and spend your entire career studying the topic. So obviously I cannot promise you to make you world-class experts on international teams in this short video training. The goal of the training is not so much to teach you all the little details and uh, tricks of managing global virtual teams, but rather give you a sense of what kind of issues come into play when you manage global virtual teams. So I'll give you a sense of the different topics that fall into this category, uh, known problems, uh, good solutions, research on the topic. And so before we get in, into any details, let me switch to the slide mode so you can see my screen. And um, this way you will be able to see some of the illustrations that you need to see in order to fully understand uh, what I'm talking about. So my background is um, currently I'm studying or um, teaching or specializing in global virtual teams as well as international teams in general. But in my previous life, my undergraduate and my master's degrees were all in economics. So basically what you would call business strategy. And one of the reasons I switched to the international human resource management and international organizational dynamics for my PhD is because at some point I realized that culture literally eats strategy for breakfast. So you can be the best strategist, you can have the best resources, but if you don't take into account culture, uh, if you have to manage people from diverse cultural backgrounds and you don't take into account culture, you probably will fail. Culture has fascinated researchers for a long, long time. Uh, this is an illustration from one of the very first manuscripts on culture I could find. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's uh, from more than 200 years ago. Uh, but uh, I would not be surprised if research or if people have started thinking about cultural differences long before. And so this particular uh, page is from a manuscript uh, by William Darton. And uh, more than 200 years ago, he already was analyzing and studying how cultures of, in this particular case, Dutchmen, Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Norwegian are different. And I have no idea whether or not those differences still persist, but the point here is that this topic is very, very old. And the good news is that we've studied it for a long time, so we know a lot about cultural differences. Now, before I get in, in any details, I did a little search, like literally right now, and uh, so as of today, and I think the number here is as 2015, but no, these are the updated figures from today. If you search for culture, cultural, that kind of term, you get 7.7 .7 billion hits on Google. For comparison, you get only half of that when you search for sex or less than half of that, almost like one third of that when you search for money. So the point here is that culture is a very, very big word. It's extremely popular. And at least on the web, it's prevalent more than other popular search terms. Um, now, what is culture? And that is a very big question. So some people, some scholars talk about culture as an onion. The reason they talk about the cu culture as an onion is because just like an onion, culture is multi-layered. You have different 
layers or different attributes of culture. At the core, you may have values. You know, that's what we believe. But then as you kind of move to the outer surface, you have rituals and then you have heroes and then you have symbols. So essentially, there are some things that you can feel and see on the surface, like the way people dress and things like that, and some things are hidden deeper inside. Another model of culture is that of an iceberg. Again, some parts of culture are visible. When you, for example, come to a new country and uh, you land at an airport and you walk out from that airport, you see that people uh, talk differently, people dress differently, people look differently. And so that's the visible attributes of culture. But then you spend more time in that culture and you realize that there is much more to culture than what meets the eye. People have different values. People have different assumptions, attitudes. And those things are not easy to see. They're kind of hidden beyond the surface of the water, below the surface of the water. Sometimes you literally would see people who have spent decades and decades in, for example, the United States and still don't fully understand the American mentality, essentially, right? So they dress like Americans. They like American food, American movies yet they still may not quite get that hidden American, you know, tested American values. Likewise, I like the model, and in fact, uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Pierre, uh, Pierre Steele came up with this comparison. Uh, some people said that culture, it's like a uh, vegetable, right? You have the foliage and you have the actual vegetable. And so by looking at the foliage, at the leaves, you can you can pretty accurately tell what culture you deal with like for example by simply noticing how the person is dressed or talks you can probably say oh this person is from saudi arabia and maybe this is an american and maybe this person is from france but in order to truly understand what that vegetable is like it's not enough just to see the leaves it's not enough just enough just to see that foliage you have to actually dig it up or, or dig down and then taste it. And so only then you will truly understand the culture. So being able to tell the cultures apart may not be sufficient to fully understand how the cultures are different. Now, does culture matter? Well, let me give you a few examples of how and when culture can be literally a matter of life and death. So here is a uh, famous example uh, from the Korean Air Flight 108 crash. So this flight uh, airplane crashed because of cultural differences. If you know anything about the Korean culture, it, it is high power distance culture. And um, in that culture, uh, people would not contradict or question or object to the statements by the figures of authority. Basically, you would not argue with your boss. And so in that particular case, uh, that particular flight, what happened was um, the flight was flying from Korea to uh, JFK, New York. And um, uh, as always, JFK was, a, was very busy. And so the airplane was asked to circle around the airport waiting for its, you know, for the for an opening to land. And as the airplane was circling around the airport, it started basically running out of fuel. And two things happened there. So the first pilot was busy and um, did not notice that they ran out of fuel. Moreover, the uh, flight controllers in New York especially tend to be, um, what's the proper word, kind of commending and authoritative in the way they talk to people. And so they essentially control the air and are figures of authority. And so the first pilot of the Korean flight um, 101, it's not even that the person did not comfortable, did not feel comfortable to tell directly to the flight controllers that they need to land now. It, it was just part of the culture simply to follow the uh, directions of the figures of authority. Now, what's remarkable here is that the second pilot did notice that the airplane is running out of fuel. But because the first pilot kept ignoring this uh, issue, the second pilot, the co-pilot, didn't feel comfortable pointing out to the captain of the flight that the, there is a problem. And so he basically knew about the problem but didn't say anything. And so the flight was 
flying around and around until it literally just ran out of fuel and fell. So a totally preventable disaster, uh, but it's due to a problem of communication, which was caused by a difference in how people communicate in these different cultures, and boom, dozens of people died. Now, if you look at this map, if I ask you what is wrong with this map, what would you say? If you are like my students, you would probably say that the map is upside down, right? Well, not entirely right. The only reason you think this map is upside down is because culturally, you know, all your life, you've been showing this map the other way around. And so you've gotten used to kind of indoctrinated into seeing Australia at the bottom of the map, and then, for example, Russia and Canada on the top of the map. But theoretically, there is no reason to believe that that way is the correct way. I mean, when you approach Earth from the space, it, it may well be that that's how you see this, you know, the, the, the planet. And so there is really geographically nothing wrong with that. It's just purely a cultural agreement that we would see this map upside down from what you see here on the screen. And here is another map that shows, again, the world in a perfectly accurate, geographically speaking way. But at the same time, to us, culturally indoctrinated people, it seems to be wrong. Now, how about this map? What is wrong with this map? <clears throat> Again, you probably would assume that the uh, error here is that the map is flipped left to right. Well, what if I showed you this? It's a real picture from a real slide, uh, from a real page of the LG's website. And so there is really nothing wrong with this picture. All is wrong with it is that it's an Asian view of the world. So in Asia, uh, Asia tends to be in the middle of the map. And so America then moves to the right and Europe moves to the left. And again, those of you who are from Europe, Africa, the Americas, uh, for to you it may look wrong and you would probably be looking for, um, I don't know, New York somewhere here and for Japan on, or Tokyo somewhere here. But this is how this map appears on the, uh, in the textbooks on geography in Asia. In fact, if you look at the map that you have, that I have here in my office, uh, I'm not sure how visible it is, but it's a pure American representation of the world. So if you can see here, I have uh, literally uh, the United States uh, and uh, Southern America in the middle of the map, and then Europe kind of to the right and Asia to the left. And so again, this is a purely American map of the world where America is put right in the middle. And uh, so I guess it's justifiable here, but it would look probably strange to you if you were trying to, you know, to analyze the picture. Um, so let me just move this here because I think, one second, let me select the different screen because I think I selected our own screen, screen. So yes, we need this one. All right, so now, here is an illustrative experiment that I do with my students when I teach this course. I would show them a series of videos where I interviewed, or not even interviewed, asked a series of people to talk about influenza, about the flu virus. And so what I did is I gave those people a um, printout from Wikipedia with a couple of paragraphs that talk about the virus, what it is, how it works, what the symptoms are, and things like that. And then I asked those people to simply read, not really read, but read the text and then kind of reproduce it in their own words. But because they just read those couple of paragraphs now, they basically say an identical text. So they all say virtually the same thing. But the speakers were selected in such a way that um, some of them were fluent in English, native speakers, and some of them were not. I had some people from uh, Asia. I had one Iranian doctor. And so they talked about uh, influenza. And so then when I asked the students, uh, and I've done it so many times, who do they think is most knowledge knowledgeable on the topic of the flu virus? Interestingly, there is always a difference in how people evaluate that expertise. And so uh, the person, for example, who always scores the lowest is actually the person who probably knows much more about that virus than anybody else. And that's my friend and colleague uh, from Iran who at the time when I recorded the video was a PhD student in business in Canada. But before that, she was a doctor. She is a medical doctor 
and she practiced as a doctor for many years. And so if anyone, she actually knows a lot about viruses and particularly the influenza virus. But uh, the people who tend to be scored higher are the ones who speak English without an accent. And especially there is this one experimental condition where the speaker wears glasses and doesn't wear glasses. And so with the glasses, she actually gets the highest scores. The point of this um, experiment is to show people that even when they hear the same text, if you split the group into you know, subgroups and show them the different videos of people saying the same uh, text, the um, way we talk, uh, especially our cultural kind of background and accent and all that stuff, often affects how we are perceived, uh, how knowledgeable we are perceived. And so here it's not even the uh, prejudice or, or racism per se. The same experiment has been conducted by many other researchers in many other settings. And for example, one study I read was uh, doing just this, exactly the same experiment, but it was conducted in Canada in Montreal. And so just like in this experiment, you know, recordings of people talking about the same thing were shown to groups of students, but some of them were from Canada, Canadian born, some of them were international students. And interestingly, the international students discriminated even more than traditional white Canadians. And so it appears that it has nothing to do with um, nationalism or um, racism per se. It seems like just over time we grow up to, you know, and are used to the idea that people who are smart, they talk well, they talk clearly, uh, they, they are confident. And so when a foreign speaker speaks slower with errors, perhaps makes mistakes occasionally, it sounds more like a person who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. And so as a result, subconsciously, those people are rated lower on their profession, uh, proficiency and skills. Um, now, I conducted a study once uh, with my good colleagues, uh, Brad Kirkman and Pierce Steele. And in that particular study, it was a meta-analysis uh, where we analyzed almost a thousand papers on the effects of culture on all kinds of workplace behaviors and attitudes and performance and things like that. And so it's a lot of numbers, and I know you see a lot of numbers on the slides now. You don't really have to read them. Let me just give you a brief overview of the findings of that study. So what we found was that culture does matter. It does correlate with organizational attitudes, you know, what people believe, as well as how people behave in the workplace. Uh, the correlations were not very strong, but strong enough to matter, which means that just because you know somebody's cultural background, it doesn't mean that you can perfectly predict that person's behavior. But at the same time, it means that you can actually say something about that person's behavior and performance and attitudes. Uh, so you, you, you can make some predictions. You will not explain everything or predict everything, but you can make some reasonably good predictions. Now, culture was found to have the strongest effect on emotions, how we manage emotions in the workplace, how easily we get angry, how much we show our emo emotions. Pretty reasonably well on attitudes, you know, what we believe, what we think. A little bit less on behaviors, how we behave, still significant, but it, a little bit less. And it had a very little perform effect on um, performance. So just because someone is from, let's say, the United States versus China, you may not necessarily be able to say who will do the job better, but you can say with a reasonable confidence how people will behave, what they will believe, and how they will display the emotions. Now, what's interesting is that when you talk about individual behaviors, yes, uh, it will be very hard to predict somebody's behavior just based on the nationality of that person. But when you talk about groups, and especially when you talk about countries, you actually can make very good predictions about the preferences of those employees, the behaviors they will display. So when you talk about them as a whole group, so in that one group, you wouldn't know which one exactly will prefer A over B, which one exactly will behave like this and not like that. But when you have a large enough group, you can say, yes, most of them will do this. Most of them will pre 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 prefer this. And so surprisingly, you can actually do that with a reasonable accuracy. And then we wanted to know if knowing somebody's nationality or culture is uh, better or more predictive than knowing somebody's, for example, uh, personality profile or maybe even IQ. 
And so surprisingly, culture was actually more predictive of uh, behaviors and attitudes in the workplace than all kinds of personality uh, surveys or tests and emotional intelligence tests and things like that. Though IQ was still a, a better predictor of the actual performance. Now, getting into the team specifically, there is one question that I ask my students, uh, which teams perform better? International or culturally diverse or homogeneous? And uh, so most students would try to guess and uh, try to give you some answers. But again, the, the, the right answer, the correct answer is it depends. Uh, if you look at the purpose of the task, then multicultural teams perform better. So experiments in this area that we've done and many other researchers have done would go like this. You would have a few teams that are culturally homogeneous, so uh, teams that are composed of people from the same country, and then you would have a sample of people who are composed of members from all around the world, and you would give them different tasks. And so if the task is something routine and simple, like for example, assemble a tower using Lego blocks, or you have an assembly line and just basically you know, work together on the assembly line, then uh, culturally homogeneous teams, so teams comprised of people from the same country, they tend to perform better. But if the task requires creativity, um, in unconventional thinking, thinking um, out of the box, then diverse teams, multicultural teams, ten, tend to actually do better. For example, if the task is come up with as many ideas as possible for how to use a plastic bag or how to solve this riddle, then people with diverse backgrounds working together tend to come up with more solutions, better ideas, uh, and so outperform homogeneous teams that way. Likewise, no matter what the task is, in the short run, people from culturally diverse backgrounds tend to work not so well together. It takes some time for them to adjust. But then over time, as they get used to one another, as they learn each other's methods and, and, and styles, they actually tend to outperform homogeneous teams. It takes usually a few weeks for them to get used to one another, but after that, they perform very well or tend to perform better than culturally homogeneous teams. Now, let me show you a short video here, and I hope it will be visible in the, uh, in the um, video stream that I'm, I'm doing here. But this one shows how culture sometimes can become a problem in cross-cultural interactions. So obviously it's an extreme case of um, cultural insensitivity, but uh, something like this can happen and uh, you probably spotted a lot of problems or culturally insensitive behaviors or mistakes, but um, it may not be easy to know all the cultural norms of the countries, cultures with which you interact. You may know a little bit about maybe the more known or popular cultures like the American culture, like the German culture, 
But uh, if you had to work, for example, I don't know, with Italians or Ukrainians or maybe Colombians or Ghanaians, um, you, you cannot know everything. And so sometimes you can get into a situation like what you saw in this video. Now, let me show you a series of um, um, illustrations that kind of sort of expl explain how uh, our brain works and how it may play out in cross-cultural communication or cross-cultural interactions to your disadvantage. Uh, you see, over the course of evolution, our brain has developed this wonderful ability to fill the gaps, the, the blind spots, and to help us kind of see the whole picture, even when the whole picture is not shown. This allows us so the brain can think very, very quickly and kind of reconstruct the missing parts so that we can quickly make the decisions and essentially survive. So when we haven't seen everything, haven't understood everything, but at the same time can quickly judge the situation and decide if we have to run or fight or whatever else we need to do. And that's how our ancestors survived. And so that propensity of the brain to use this previous knowledge, to use this background information to uh, form a whole picture, serves us very well in most situations. But sometimes it may not work very well when the situation is unfamiliar, when we have, when we are in a new environment, when we are in an unfamiliar environment. Look, for example, at this picture. You probably have seen it many times, right? So which of the orange dots is bigger? This one, the one on the left, or this one, the one on the right? You probably know the drill, and you probably know that the two dots are the same size. But our brain looks at the background and uses those blue, big and blue, small dots and tries to judge the size of the orange dot in relationship to this pr prior knowledge, the background. And it sure tricks us, it, it betrays us. It actually tells us that the uh, uh, orange dot on the right is bigger than the orange dot on the left, even though they're the same. And so our brain sometimes misjudges the size if uh, the background looks different to us, right? So as you see, it's exactly the same size, but um, our brain does not give us the right decision. Likewise, when you look at the quadrants here, the cell labeled A and the cell labeled, labeled B, what are the colors? If you're like most, you would probably say that the A cell is black or maybe a dark gray, and the B cell is white. But again, your brain misjudges the color uh, and it uses the background to kind of give you that information and that is not true. So let me show you this. So you see this is the A cell, this is the B cell. Let me move it away from the background. You see it's exactly the same color. So the brain sees the shadow and tries to restore the picture to the true meaning. And so this additional information that you know that you have, that the shadow can distort the, the, the colors actually tricks you and you get wrong information. So when you misinterpret the background information, you can misjudge the color, not only the size as before. Here's the same uh, question. So you have this cell in the middle and this cell in the middle. One of them looks yellow to you and one of them looks brown to you. But if I do this, you will see that they're exactly the same. Again, the brain uses this background information to give you the right information and in the process tricks you into believing a wrong thing. Uh, I'll skip this illustration. I'm not sure if it's going to be displayed properly on your screen, uh, so I'll, I'll just move here. How about the shape or direction? Again, you probably have seen this picture before and even if you have, the two lines probably look a little bent to you. Like One is bending upwards and the other one is bending downwards. But if I take those two lines out of the context, you see right away that they are perfectly straight lines. So the brain, when it sees an unfamiliar new background and uses that information to form a decision, it can betray you or it can give you wrong information about the size, about the color, and now about the direction. How about the shape? Again, these two tables probably look different to you. One looks long and one looks basically rectangular and one looks square. 
But again, if you judge, uh, I mean, if you look at the actual sizes, you will see that the blue line is exactly the same length as the blue line here. And the same applies to the yellow line. And just because I put the tables on the picture in a way that suggests that one is long and one is square, your brain thinks that way, even though mathematically it's exactly the same shape. Same thing here, so you have uh, perfectly concentrical circles, but your brain uh, starts processing the information and uses the previous knowledge and background and kind of gives you the spirals instead of circles. And if you don't believe me that those are the circles, yes, they were the circles. But once I remove them, you see the spirals all over again. So our you know, brain is wonderful, but sometimes it lies to us. How about this one? Which line is longer, A or B? I bet you think that they're the same length, and you are wrong. That line A is longer than line B. And the reason you were, again, tricked into believing that they are the same length is because all the previous exercises were around, you know, showing the difference when there is none. And so when finally there is a difference, and you saw there is a difference, you clearly see that A is longer than B. You use the previous knowledge, kind of cultural knowledge, to make the decision, and your decision is, again, wrong. So the point of this exercise is that when it comes to judging what's going on and making decisions and uh, interpreting the situations, our brain relies on the pre prior knowledge. Our brain tries to educate you, tries to give you the information based on the uh, interpretation of, of the background information of what you know from your previous life, essentially. And as I said, it works very well when you deal with the people in, the, in an environment that you know. But if it happens to be a new cultural environment, in many cases, that actually can be a disservice to you. So you may literally be lost and um, misinterpret the signals, uh, misunderstand people, and basically have all kinds of problems with your cross-cultural, international team members. Now, let's talk a little bit about communication. Again, I'm not planning to teach you or to explain in all the details all the possible models of cross-cultural communication. I'll just tell you that communication styles are different in different cultures, and people get to the point or people communicate the message in different ways in different cultures. So, for example, here is one of the models of cultural differences in communication. This one was developed by Harry Triandis. And so he described five different styles of communication. So in English language cultures, uh, basically at that time it would have been America, uh, the UK, um, and then former uh, UK colonies like Canada or Australia, the communication style is basically direct. So people get right to the point, and what they say, that's what they are trying to say. But then you can have a style that is Semitic, or Oriental, or Romans, or Slavic, and I guess those figures are self uh, you know, clearly self-understood based on the on the graphics. So, like for example, in the Oriental cultures in Asia, people often would not get to the point directly, but will kind of circle around, and will not tell you directly what they're trying to say, but will try to kind of softly present the point uh, without saying it directly and explicitly and so on and so on. Again, you don't have to remember all the styles. The point here is to show that, yes, styles are different. They vary in systemic ways. And uh, if you know the general principles, you can probably interpretate, interpret uh, the uh, communication from a person from that culture a little bit better. So here is another model. Again, you don't have to know all the details, but so this one is based on classifying the communication styles along three possible dimensions or three po possible um, uh, styles or attributes. So in one quadrant here on the lower left, you have the so-called so linear active communication style. And that's how, again, Americans, Germans, Swiss communicate. So they kind of get it more directly to the point. Sometimes at the expense of being maybe rude or maybe not very sensitive or not very polite. And then you have, in the lower right corner, you have that reactive communication styles. So those are more kind of courteous, accommodating, listening. So maybe not being too direct when this information can hurt the receiver of the information. So these tend to be much more um, accommodative, I guess, in that sense. And so that's the Asian um, uh, corner. And then you have what uh, the author here calls um, 
uh, Ronald Lewis calls emotional, uh, I mean, multi uh, active communication styles. So they tend to be emotional and expressive. And so they um, uh, basically, you know, uh, people are talking fast and loud and use gestures all the time. And so that would be your uh, Latin American or Southern European communication styles, like Italian, like, like Spanish. And so again, uh, the study here conducted here or depicted here has put a bunch of countries on this triangle to show how these styles vary. And so some of them are one and some of them are sort of in the middle, like Belgium is a little linear active, but a little multi-reactive, multi-active and so on. And so in, in that study, uh, the authors also tested a number of hypotheses and showed uh, which countries have an easier time communicating with one another. And sometimes communication may be difficult. Like for example, when you have team members from uh, linear active and multi-active cultures, interaction becomes very difficult. So the uh, Hispanics, the Spaniards, uh, the uh, Italians tend to be very active and expressive. And so sometimes it leads to conflicts and misunderstandings with people, for example, from Switzerland or Germany. So, uh, but when you have some people from Asia, some people from Europe, communication tends to be fine. It's not easy, but it's fine. And then, so when you have, again, people from Southern Europe, Latin American cultures and Asia, they can get to the point eventually, but it becomes time consuming. Again, you don't have to remember all those points, but just remember that when team members in an international team have a conflict or have a misunderstanding. It may not necessarily be to the fact that somebody is wrong or somebody is bad. It could merely mean that the communication styles are different enough that that created a problem with understanding each other. And so people basically ran into problems because of the culture and not because of low performance or problems with personalities or some, some other things. Now, when we talk about cultural differences uh, in communication, there could be all kinds of other things. I mean, obviously the language, uh, people from one country speak one language and people from another country speak another language and that is a problem, but that's easy. The reason it's easy because, you know, you just learn the language. Uh, it's easy to recognize that there is a difference and so the result, you, uh, you work on it. So for example, uh, most of you or most of the ex-culture participants in global virtual teams would be using English as a working language. And so there would be some commonality there. And if somebody is not fluent in the language, people at least see that and they maybe give a little bit more time to that person to understand what the person is saying. But there are other types of um, language attributes that are non-verbal, so basically not related to the actual words, but still have a huge effect on how people are mis uh, interpreted or misinterpreted. For example, the speech pace. A number of studies have shown that in some cultures, people who speak quickly are judged as knowledgeable. Oh, he must know this topic so well because he speaks so fast about it. In other cultures, people who speak slowly are attributed more credibility and more knowledge on the subject. Oh, he speaks slowly. He probably is relaxed, he is confident, so he must know his topic very well. And so again, depending on how fast you speak in different cultures, you may, you may be attributed a different level of expertise. And so in cultures like Latin American cultures, like again, Southern European cultures, some uh, Middle Eastern cultures, the speech pace is very fast. And so if you take a person like that and put that person, for example, in some Asian cultures, where, or maybe some Northern European cultures where the pace of speech is very slow, then that person may be interpreted wrong. So that the fast speech may be taken as, oh, all talk and no knowledge. And vice versa, when you get somebody from a slow culture or slow speech pace culture, like for example, from Finland, and you put that person, for example, in Mexico, the person will talk slowly, but the locals may interpret that, oh, he probably doesn't know what he's talking about because he's so slow in selecting the proper words and communicating the message across. Likewise, the interruption rate. In some cultures, it is perfectly acceptable to interrupt and multiple people would be talking at the same time all the time. In other cultures, no, 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 no interruptions whatsoever. And if you interrupt, that may be interpreted as extreme rudeness, as your lack of interest in the topic. In, in, so it could be a big, big problem. In fact, when Americans started doing business with the Japanese, especially in the 70s and then more so in the 80s, one of the big problems was around this specific issue. 
uh, in Japan, it is customary to have prolonged moments of silence when people are talking about work. So if somebody says something and people just sit and think about it. Give time to each other to reflect. Now for Americans, that was strange. That was in fact sometimes torturous. I mean, for them, yes, maybe five seconds of silence is fine. But then it would be 10 seconds and 20 seconds and sometimes a minute or two. And that, that's strange. I mean, they find it strange. They find it inconvenient. They find it um, literally torturous. And so they would try to say something, but then the Japanese would interpret that as a lack of respect or a lack of, lack of interest in the topic and so obviously conflicts would ensue, uh, misunderstandings happen and all kinds of problems happen. Even when people speak a similar language, sometimes actually that could be a problem. Uh, for example, those of you who speak German may know that in German the word mist may mean, uh, not may mean, it means, uh, means uh, uh, basically shed, manure, right? And when they say like so in mist, it literally means what is shed. In English, the word mist is spelled exactly the same way and is pronounced exactly the same way, but it means haze and fog. And so just because you speak a similar language, uh, you, you may actually have more problems interpreting the, the words. Uh, or for example, actually. In English, it means actually uh, means, you know, in reality. Whereas in France, uh, French, I think it's spelled slightly differently and pronounced slightly differently, but it would mean presently at this very moment. And so the difference is important but subtle and you may not necessarily catch it from the context of the communication and you may think that you understood the person. You hear the word that you know, but it actually means something slightly different. Here is a short video that um, shows how uh, communication sometimes again can be disastrous. And this one is a joke. Das Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you over? I mean, we are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? So obviously it's a joke. But yes, I mean, it seems like a similar word, you know it and you think you understand it and in reality you may not understand it. Uh, here are a few examples of how languages may be similar but drastically different and so here are some examples of the British versus American English. Some things are easy, like for example, I live in a block of flats. So in German, I mean in, in, in the British version of English it would mean I live in an apartment building. Americans probably will understand it, but the block means more of a kind of like a block of streets rather than a block of, you know, apartments. Uh, what, con what confuses me most is that the word billion means different things in the U.S. and the U.K. So in the U.S., a billion is a number with nine zeros, right? In the U.K., a billion is a number with 12 zeros. So the number of uh, zeros is literally different by, by three. And so the number with 12 zeros in American English is trillion. And so uh, whereas uh, the what, what Americans call a billion, the British would call a thousand million or a milliard. And so if you're in accounting, for example, I mean, we are talking about a difference that is 1,000 times. And so you don't want to make that mistake. I don't want to get into other words, I just wanted to show you that even British and American English are substantially different. Now, even numbers are different. You would think that numbers are the same in all languages, in all cultures, but they are not. My very first exam in uh, the United States when I, studied, I started studying here in 2001, statistics. Professor Jagowski was my professor, and I lost points. My very first exam, I lost points on writing one like this. So, you know, in Europe, in much of Asia, one is basically two sticks together. 
Now in American language uh, or American culture, uh, this number here with kind of two sticks looks like seven. So the American one is just one stick, one uh, you know segment, not two. So American seven is basically like the European one, and the European seven has this extra one cross. And so therefore, again, you know, little thing, but you can literally lose points on the exam. And if you're an accountant, if you're, you know, think, talking about a contract, it may be a huge difference in the number of dollars or euros or whatever the currency you will get. Now, again, American four is like this, whereas the European four is like this. But the European four looks to Americans more like a six, right? And so when I show this number to Americans, they actually say, no, that's a six, that's not a four. Whereas Europeans, Asians say, no, 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 that's a four. And so that's the six in America, so it doesn't have that hook on the top. And that's the six in Europe, Asia, I don't know much about Africa or Australia, but I imagine it would be probably more like European rather than like American. And so the same thing with nine. American nine has a straight uh, line on the bottom, whereas uh, the European nine tends to be more like a hook. So, uh, you know, little thing, but big difference. Now, language may also affect the way people think and people act. For example, studies show that people from Greece tend to interrupt. And it's not only applicable to Greece, it's people who speak languages that have the same structure as the Greek language. And the structure there is that the important things are put at the beginning of the sentence. And so usually you kind of know what the person is trying to say after hearing the first two, three words of the sentence. Now in German language or some other languages that are structured like German, the important things are put at the end of the language. Like for example, if you want to say in German, I went to school yesterday with my friend carrying a bag. So you would say in English, for example, the important stuff in the beginning, I went to school, which is important, and then all the details. In German, you would say, ich bin, and then you would put all that with my friend, and then, you know, uh, walking, and then with a bag, and only in the end, you would say, gegangen, so basically went, uh, or gone. And so until you hear that last word, you would never really know what happened at the school, or what did you do with the school. So it's very important to hear the whole thing, and so the studies show that languages that are structured like the Greek language, they tend to have a greater interruption rate when people talk in those languages. Whereas in cultures that are using languages that are structured like the German language, where the important stuff comes at the end, people interrupt less. And again, it seems like a huge difference, but it could be a huge difference when you have people from those cultures in a global virtual team or a or a face-to-face -face international team. You literally can, you know, uh, it can literally determine who is perceived as polite, as trustworthy, as worthy a promotion and who is not, who gets a better job and who is not, who gets to be a leader, who gets paid more. And so all of those are very important issues. Likewise, when we speak a different language, we often answer to the questions differently. Studies show that, for example, when people who speak both English and Spanish or English and Arabic, for example, international students, are asked questions about um, uh, family uh, values or attitudes about politics, they would be given exactly the same questions, like word to word, and asked exactly the same thing. But their answers would vary depending on which language the interview is conducted. So same person when asked, for example, how important it is to respect elderly, may give a slightly different answer when that question is in Spanish or Arabic than when that question is in English. And the funny thing is that when you ask that interviewee later on, did they notice that they provided different answers, like on a five-point scale? They would say, no, 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 I mean, it didn't matter to me. Yes, I noticed that it's the same question, so I gave the same answer, and in reality, they actually give different answers. And again, that may affect what results you get in your uh, multiple-choice personality tests, for example, or maybe when you apply for a promotion, so very important stuff. Uh, obviously, nonverbal communication when it comes to gestures is very different. Uh, so here you see a symbol that means very different things in different cultures. And there are all kinds of jokes, you know, like for example, in Northern Europe, people usually don't use gestures. When they talk, they just, you know, don't use hands. And there is this joke that when Italians speak, uh, if you tie their hands together, they will not be able to speak because it's all uh, expressive. It's all, you know, lots of gestures, lots of, you know, 
pizza pronto, principessa, signoro. So uh, again, it's obviously you know a stereotype, but there is something to it, and depending on which culture you come from and how you speak, you may be interpreted differently. Here is one of the kind of more popular examples. Uh, so nodding, so basically um, showing doing this, uh, you know, like up and down. Uh, may mean yes in some cultures, but in Albania, in Bulgaria, it actually means no. And then the opposite uh, is true for, you know, for shaking a hand side to side. Also, sometimes uh, Indian head shake, and it's not exactly like no in the Western cultures, but it's a, you know, closer to no than to yes when you agree and show respect. Now, let me talk also about some topics that are a little bit more taboo, but they come into play all the time, especially in international teams and global virtual teams. One would be the effect of um, different appearance, black sheep, as I call it. So when you have all the people from one culture who dress similarly, who um, look similarly, they tend to sort of exclude from the discussion people who are look different. And again, it's not because of racism or prejudice. It's just a normal tendency. For some reason, it happens in all cultures by all people. So people who look different tend to be paid less attention to, if I can put it this way. So if you happen to be, let's say, in an American, uh, predominantly American team, but you are, let's say, for example, from the Middle East or from maybe India and you were uh, your national clothing, and you may have a slightly different appearance. Uh, unintentionally, the majority of the team will kind of pay a little bit less attention to you. But the opposite happens when, again, when the team is predominantly, let's say, for example, Indian or maybe Arabic, and you have someone, you know, from I don't know, Europe, let's say, you know, the typical, you know, T-shirts and jeans and white and... Uh, and so that person tends to be a little bit more excluded in those cultures. It happens all the time. But the problem becomes even bigger when you have people from differently developed countries. So when you have some people from so-called developed countries like the United States or France, and you have some people from maybe so-called developing countries like, uh, for example, maybe African countries or Latin American countries. Again, people tend to assume that your expertise is tied to the development of your country. If you come, for example, from Ghana or from Nigeria, it's not that they think about it consciously, but subconsciously they often tend to assume, oh, what can you know about business when your country doesn't even have, I don't know, running water in all the little towns. And vice versa, if you come from a developed country like the United States, Switzerland, Japan, in many cases you sort of have this credit of um, trust of, of expertise uh, it's attributed to you because, well, he comes from such a developed country, he's, he, he must really know how business works or how technology works. And it's not always the case. I mean, those assumptions sometimes are wrong. But uh, studies show again and again and again and again that the kind of image of your country is generalized to your own image. And people assume that you are more like your country before they get to know you. Likewise, we talked about language proficiency. The more fluent you are, the more expertise you are attributed. And the same thing with representation. So people tend to pay less attention to minority, regardless of where the studies are conducted. So uh, for example, in Japan, uh, they tend to discriminate against uh, Europeans. And uh, in America, they probably discriminate against, not probably, unfortunately, sometimes they discriminate against, let's say, Asians, and so on and so forth. So those are less obvious, less visible issues. And even when people think that they're completely, completely oblivious, indifferent to cultural differences, to economic differences, political differences, in reality, that does play a role. You would be, I've seen a number of studies, for example, where people would be asked if they would take race, for example, into consideration when deciding whom to hire. And they would say, oh, no way. I mean, I don't care. If the person is an expert, I will hire the person regardless of the skin color of the country of origin and things like that. But then you would do the same, put the same people in front of a computer screen and you would uh, give them all kinds of tests. Like for example, you would flash pictures of different people of different right races and ask them to quickly select the first word that comes to mind. Or uh, you would give them pictures of people of different races and ask them uh, all kinds of you know scenarios and ask you know to determine who the I don't know 
a robber, a bandit, you know, a bad guy or a good guy. And unfortunately, unfortunately, even people who genuinely believe they're not racist, they tend to still sometimes discriminate and are less likely to hire someone who is maybe black or jump to the conclusion that the guy who is black is the one who is a criminal, even though, um, again, they may not even realize that. But uh, in the controlled experiments, unfortunately, the results still show that we kind of do that. And so it's important to remember that you know, it's not to criticize someone. As I said, everybody does it. It's not like the white people are racist and the black people are always victims. When it comes to this tendency, it, it happens you know, everywhere. And uh, sometimes we just don't know it. So when people speak in a foreign language, they tend to make mistakes. They tend to use simpler language. They tend to over explain and repeat some things multiple times. And as a result, that may affect how we perceive them. And so it's important to keep in mind that uh, those things affect us, but not always are true. Now, another difference in communication is um, so-called self-promotion. People in some cultures tend to be much more self-promoting than people in other cultures. So for example, uh, I do this experiment with my students all the time. I would ask them to write a short introduction, sh short passage about themselves and basically introduce themselves to the class or pretend that they are looking for a mate, for a, um, a life partner, wife, husband, and uh, they have to introduce themselves on a dating website. And so what usually happens is something like this. So people from, uh, let's say, Asian cultures would often describe themselves in the tone that is um, very modest, very self-effacing, like they would say, oh, Although I'm not very good looking, I'm willing to try my best and work hard and, you know, maybe, you know, be good for you. And then when you look at Americans, singles ads, and by the way, uh, these are from real studies that looked at the singles ads in real newspapers at that time. So Americans tend to be very self-promoting. So they would say things like, oh, a handsome, athletic male with a good sense of humor seeks a fun line partner. So they tend to be much more self-promoting, much less modest. And again, it seems like it's a, you know, fun, cute thing, but when it comes to, you know, uh, applying for jobs, for example, it can play a very important role. So uh, it can determine who gets a job, maybe determined who is perceived as knowledgeable, as ready. So, for example, if you happen to have an Asian employee working for an American boss, that modesty may be interpreted as a lack of uh, confidence, as lack of knowledge, and uh, so that's potentially a problem. And vice versa, when you have, let's say, an American employee working for an Asian uh, boss, being so self-promoting, that American employee may be perceived as, uh, you know, not serious enough, or maybe talking too much, or maybe misjudging his or her own skills. And so that's potentially a problem. Then how emotion is uh, managed in the workplace. Again, in the Western world, uh, normally, the, the display of emotions in the workplace is not uh, welcome, it's frowned upon. So if you get too emotional at work, uh, you may be perceived as less professional. Uh, workers in the West are told to leave their emotions at home. And when they are being criticized or when something bad happens, they ask or taught not to take it personally. And uh, when they become too emotionally attached at work to other employees, that may be perceived as corruption or nepotism. But then in some other cultures, notably, for example, in Latin American cultures, it's the opposite. People tend to explain, display emotions more freely. They tend to get more involved. Hiring relatives uh, or friends may be perceived as good practice because you know that builds trust. And so it's not nepotism, it's, it's basically good business sense. Uh, in experiments that we've done, as well as many other researchers have done, uh, they would go something like this. Like, for example, in one study, the subjects would be shown photos, pictures of the desks of different employees. There is no person at the desk, just the photo of the desk. And then in different pictures, there would be a different number of personal items on the desk. So somebody may only have a picture of the family, but somebody may have some toys and maybe trophies from the fishing trip and stuff like that. And so when those pictures are shown to American um, uh, subjects, uh, study participants, if the number of items on the desk, if of all the, the items, 20 or more percent are 
emotional items, like as I said, a picture of the family or maybe some, uh, I don't know, toys, then the person will be perceived as not professional enough. Oh, it's just too much play. It's not professional. Whereas in Latin American cultures, that threshold is more like 70, 80 percent. At some point, even for them, it's, you know, it may be too many emotional things. But that threshold is much, much higher, right? Now, when people work in international teams, sometimes, and that is a problem, they uh, expect this vacation, this, you know, nice, joyous experience where, you know, uh, they, they love uh, each other, they enjoy each other's company, they learn new cultures. But in reality, sometimes it can be very frustrating. It can be very different from, you know, what the movies show you. And that's very important to remember because that can affect, uh, you know, how you will eventually be performing, what you like and what you don't like. When it comes to selecting employees, for example, or evaluating employees, just as an example, even simple things like you would think that are so objective that there could be no problem there. Things like, for example, uh, standardized tests, multiple choice tests. You would think that those would be an objective way to measure somebody's attitudes or performance. If, for example, you wanted to give your employees a test in personality to see whose personality is more suitable for a particular task, well, it may not work. Uh, studies show again and again that people from different cultures uh, treat multiple choice tests different. So, for example, differently. So, for example, Americans tend to choose extreme points when you ask them, do you agree or disagree with this statement? If they kind of agree with the statement, they will probably choose five, strongly agree. And they kind of, and when they kind of disagree with the statement, uh, they would choose one, strongly disagree. Whereas Asians tend to choose points closer to the middle. So they would often choose on a five point scale a three. And then when they disagree, even if they disagree very strongly, in most cases they would put two, hardly ever do, do they go to the extreme and choose one. And vice versa, when they agree with the statement, even if they agree very strongly, hardly ever do they put it five. They would put probably four or maybe even still stick with a three. And so what that means is that the results of the test may be misinterpreted. You may have two people who give exactly the same numbers, precisely the same numbers, but they meant different things or vice versa. You may see different numbers and you may assume that somebody scores higher on conscientiousness or openness to experience. But all that may mean is that the culturally kind of biased response style to multiple choice tests is just different in those two cultures. There are many other types of, um, there are many other types of response styles. So I'm not going to get into all of those just to give you an example. So you know that those things can play out and can determine who gets heard and who gets ignored, who gets promoted and who is not. And so those are all very important issues. Now, let me give you an example here uh, or a hypothetical scenario and let's see how you would uh, resolve this situation. So, and here I'm talking about the compensation and um, rewards in international teams. Imagine a situation where you have a team of 10 engineers, five of whom are from the United States and five are from Mexico. And those 10 people are sent to, let's say, for example, Ukraine to build or install some equipment at a factory. And so they work for a week and the whole project, let's say, just to keep the numbers round, costs $10,000. So this team gets $10,000 for doing their job, plus, let's say, travel expenses and housing paid. The question is, how would you distribute that $10,000 among those 10, um, five Mexican and five American engineers? Give it a thought and tell me what you think, or I wish you could tell me, but, you know, tell yourself what you think. When I ask this question of my students in my courses, I get all kinds of answers. Some students would say, well, give everyone the same amount of money. And then somebody else will say, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean a different, I mean, same amount of money? Uh, you have to give Americans more because uh, the cost of living there is more. And so if an American gets $1,000 for a week of work in a foreign country, that's, I mean, that's not serious. It's probably not even going to pay his bills. Whereas $1,000 for someone, for example, from Mexico for a week of work, that's a lot of money. Many people there don't make that much even in a month. But then another person would say, so what you're saying is that you want to pay differently to people who worked at the same site, 
completed the same work for the same period of time. That doesn't seem fair. And so the point here is not to find the correct answer. Yes, some companies would adjust the pay of their expatriates uh, based on the cost of living in that country. Somebody would pay everyone the same amount of dollars or whatever the currency. But the point here is that there seems to be no simple answer to this question. You ask multiple people and they will give you different answers and they will not agree on what is right and what is wrong. And so the whole point of this exercise is to show that even on such simple matters or seemingly simple matters, different people may have drastically different opinions. Now, and that's what we call distributive justice. Uh, so when it comes to distributive justice, people have different opinions, what is fair and what is not. What is fair, how the, the resources, or maybe even punishments, should be distributed. In some cultures, notably, for example, uh, the United States, uh, some Western cultures, the so-called equity rule prevails. So in those cultures, it is believed that if somebody works more or maybe makes a bigger mistake, then that person should get more pay or rewarded more or maybe punished more. Uh, and then in other cultures, it's more about equality. If there is a group of people working together, then they feel that, well, everybody should be compensated roughly equally. And you, by the way, see that difference dramatically in, for example, the pay structure at organizations. In the United States, uh, the difference between the pay of the CEO and the pay of the subordinates is huge, hugely, hugely bigger than, for example, the pay difference in a collectivist culture like uh, Japan. So in the United States, the average difference in the pay of a CEO versus an average employee, I'm not talking about the lowest paid, I'm talking about the average employee for the company. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies, the difference is roughly 528 to one. So a CEO, a manager gets 528 times more because presumably the manager does more important work, work hard, works harder, his decisions are more consequential. In Japan, the ratio, I mean, obviously managers still make more, but the, the ratio is much, much smaller, usually 10 to 20 to 30, maybe to 50 in some companies. So much, much smaller. Uh, again, cultural probably. But then when it gets to seniority, again, in some cultures, people who are more senior get much more. In others, not necessarily. So again, in Japan, for example, two people may be doing the same job. One may be much older than another one, has been with the company much, much longer, but the job is the same yet the older person will still get much more pay. In the United States, in most cases, it wouldn't matter. I mean, you're paid on the hourly basis, and it doesn't matter how long you worked. There may be, may be a slight increase, like 5%, 10% more, just because over time, uh, you know, you kind of gain some seniority, but the difference wouldn't be huge. And in some cultures, it may be need-based. Uh, so the person in most need, uh, you know, gets the most. Uh, he has two kids and a sick wife, so he should get more. And you are young, you don't have family yet, you don't have any bills to pay, so you will survive on less. And so the point here, again, is not to show that some cultures are uh, right or some cultures are wrong or some decision methods are better than others. The point here is to say that if you ask different people, they will have a different opinion and that will lead to uh, conflicts, that will lead to uh, different workload distribution and uh, different compensation. And so. Uh, it plays, you know, it, it comes up all the time, all the time in global virtual teams especially and in international teams too. Why in global virtual teams especially? Because each person is not only from a different culture, but each person is also in a different culture at the time of the participation. So they're physically in different countries. And so those institutional and, uh, institutional and cultural differences become even more pronounced. And when it comes to procedural justice, again, who gets to make the decision? Again, people may, may have different opinions. In some cultures, again, notably individualist, low power distance cultures like Europe, uh, Northern Europe especially, uh, but also America, for example, Canada, the decision making mode is cooperative. So we talk it over. If I disagree with my boss, it is perfectly fine to challenge and to sit down and talk and decide together. In other cultures, notably high power distance cultures, uh, collectivist cultures, uh, masculine cultures, the mode is more directive. So the boss tells us, and in fact, if you give too much power to the people in those cultures, studies have shown, and I, I'm not going to claim that is always the case, but studies have shown that sometimes 
it actually may not even work very well. So people don't expect to be making decisions if they're in lower um, uh, ranks. In America, for example, even the lowest uh, you know employees tend to be tend to prefer to be heard and feel perfectly comfortable to call their bosses by the first name. Hey, what's up, Bob? Even though Bob is the CEO, uh, whereas in other cultures it's not the case, and people are not comfortable doing all that and you know contradicting their teachers or team leaders or managers. And then in some cultures it's a mediation method. So a third party, a lawyer, will tell us or a senior will tell us. And again, happens all the time. And for example, uh, Japan, in many cases, the senior people uh, would serve as mediators or in some African cultures. Again, there are uh, the elderly. Uh, when there is a conflict, people go to them and they, they will you know, essentially mediate the case. It's not necessarily that they will tell what needs to be done, but they will try to mediate and help the parties to reach an agreement. And again, not one method be being better than the other. It just, you know, it just simply that uh, there are differences and people can disagree and that can have a profound effect on the team dynamics and team performance. Who should make the decisions? I'll just give you again a few more examples of studies that looked at this issue and um, it's, in this case the reason I like these few studies it's not even that it shows that people differ and have different opinions. It actually shows that performance changes depending on which method is used in which culture. For example, in this one study, the researchers had a group of kids, children, and they had a series of puzzles for them, uh, anagrams, uh, basically like puzzles. And uh, uh, the children were required to solve as many puzzles as possible in a given period of time, I think in five minutes. But in one group, the children were allowed to choose uh, several of those puzzles from a larger pile. So they could choose whatever they want to work on and once they select, they would be given a time and they would try to solve them as quickly as possible. And then in another group, people uh, or students were, uh, the choices were made by the teachers. So the students would walk in the room and they would see a pile of those anagrams and puzzles and the teacher would select several of those, let's say 10 and give them to the students and say, okay, you will work on these few do them as quickly as possible. And yet in another group of people, students, the students were told that the selections were made by their mothers. So they walk in the room, they see a pile of uh, puzzles on the table, and the teacher would give that student uh, several of them and say, I called your mother and your mother said that these would be the best suited for you. So work on these and try to solve as many of them as quickly as possible. And so they've done that study in Japan and in the United States. And so where do you think or which condition resulted in the best performance? When students could select their work themselves, when teachers, bosses selected the work for them, and when their parents, mothers selected the work for them. Remarkably, there was a big difference depending on the country. In the United States, students literally performed better when or solved more, more puzzles or quicker when they could choose which ones they work on. So they were performing better when they were given the choice of the work they would complete. But then when the teacher selected the work, American students actually performed less or we, uh, slower while the Japanese students performed better. And when the students were told that their parents selected the work for them in America, the results were the worst and in Japan, the results were the best. So in fact, when in America, the students were told that the teachers called their parents to ask what kind of puzzle, what kind of task will be best for them. They would say, you called my mother? I mean, they were surprised, like, how could you? Why couldn't you ask just me? Whereas in Japan, the response was, oh, thank you so much. Yes, my parents know me best, so thank you. And so they would actually perform better on those puzzles, even though they're all exactly the same difficulty. In fact, they were all given the same puzzles in any, in any kind of case. But when they thought that their parents made those choices for them, they actually performed better. So it's not a matter of just simply, you know, happy employees or unhappy employees. You as a manager can literally get a different result. People can literally do a better job or a worse job. And finally, reaction to injustice. So when after everything, you know, decision-making process and the decisions have been made, who gets what? What if you still believe that it's not fair? What if you still believe that your job, you know, you're underpaid, 
that you're underappreciated, what will you do? Again, in some cultures, uh, especially collectivist, high power distance cultures, people react with loyalty. They just basically say, all right, I'm not happy, but I'm not going to quit my job. I'm not going to fight my boss. I'll, you know, just uh, suck it up. Just, you know, basically will be not happy, but I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this. In other cultures, um, especially if those are masculine cultures or, uh, you know, like Eastern Europe in many cases, people would just react with neglect. They would not quit the job, but they would think, okay, if they don't pay me more, if they don't pay me what I deserve, I might as well work less. And so this way, at least I will be fairly compensated for the little work that I do. And in some other cultures, especially low power distance cultures, people often uh, react with a voice. So they actively seek justice. They can sue the company. They can sue the boss. They can make a big fuss. They can talk to the superiors and they try to do something about it. And in some cultures, people just exit. You know, I don't like it here. You don't want to pay me as much as I want. I'm out of here. And again, it may be economic. Maybe they have more opportunities to find another job or it could be cultural. And uh, so again, not that one method is better than another. Sometimes maybe you should just, you know, shut up and do your job. Maybe it's not the time to argue. And sometimes maybe you have to stand up for yourself, even if it means standing up to the boss, to the person who is a figure of authority. But again, the point here is that different people will have different opinions, and it's very important to recognize that difference. Now, I'm going to stop here. And as I said, I've covered only a small, small portion. I mean, to do it right, to truly understand global international teams, we would have to spend dozens and dozens of hours and even then probably we will not cover everything and then again i don't know everything even if i were able to share everything with you that would still be a small portion of the actual knowledge but i hope that after this module you have a better understanding of the types of issues the teams are faced with a better understanding of the type of challenges uh, the type of solutions that are present there and so hopefully that this will inspire you to study more around this topic. And then obviously once you complete uh, the practical phase, you probably will have observed many more you know, situations like this and will have a much deeper understanding. So anyway, we're going to stop here. For your uh, portfolio, you will be required to create uh, a video lecture just like this one. And you can record yourself like this or you can do it differently. But this is just an example of what it might look like. And uh, keep your eyes open and try to observe as much as possible when it comes to cultural differences in the team interactions and um, teamwork. And so hopefully you will be able to observe enough to perhaps write a paper about it one day or put it in your reflection paper or maybe prepare a training module on that topic specifically, Tim, and this one. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I would appreciate your feedback.